2015, the year that I was overseas in Japan teaching English oral communication to high school students. At first, the whole scenario, if you can picture it, is actually quite strange. I mean, here was this Cambodian teacher who was born and raised in New Zealand, teaching Japanese students the English language in the land of the rising sun, Japan. For them, it would have been a very awkward experience to start off with, but that is understandable. But one of the ways that I bonded with my students was to give them a chance to Q&A me at the end of each class. In January, it started off with simple questions like, who is your favorite musician? What is your favorite color? And my personal favorite, do all New Zealanders look like hobbits? <laughs> and as the year progressed, they began to inquire much less about me and much more about who and what I represent. What was it like growing up in New Zealand? How many other Asian students were there at your school? What was it like interning for your government? And what was it like speaking at international conferences? I told them all about our multicultural haven, about the All Blacks, and about how the only color New Zealanders ever seem to care about is the silver on your fern. But seriously, it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life so far to have carried bored students from when they were in January through to being incredibly excited and eager scholars of the English language by November. But one particular incident happened on my final day that I will never forget. One of my students actually came to see me at my desk in the staff room to wish me farewell. And his name was Takeshi. Takeshi was a normal student. He did enough to pass. He participated in class activities. He did his readings, did his homework. But he always considered English to be just another compulsory subject, like maths, which he would never need after high school, which is why I was doubly impressed when he came to say farewell in English. And towards the end of our conversation, we talked about things like color, the things about traveling to New Zealand. But towards the end, he asked me a really profound question. And that question was this. Sensei, I am still so young. I'm only a youth. But how can I dare to dream of something as serious as serving my country too? And to answer this, one particular man's face popped into my head. And I hope I don't embarrass him today. So, two years ago, 2014, Mr. Lou Gardner was newly employed by my school as a leadership teacher. But I was lucky enough to have him as my mentor. Mr. Lou Gardner, or Lou as you like to be called, was one of the most genuine people I have ever met in my life. From a young age, he was always interested in education, especially in becoming a teacher at high school, because he believed that this was the age where people are most likely to remember important life lessons. But he came from a large family of six, and it would have been too greedy for him uh, to have pursued his goal instead of supporting his family. But this didn't dim his leadership quality. In fact, his leadership quality began, was kick-started when he decided to become a, a captain of the first 15 rugby team at his school. And Lou was loved by his teammates, right? And he was a really hard worker, he tried really hard, he perfected his game, he made sure that he was onside, that he could lead. But the manager of that team told him that he wouldn't be good enough, that he would be a disgrace. And the reason? Lou had a lisp, which was a speech impediment. That would have been too awkward for the team when he was giving thank you speeches to other's colleges. And I remember thinking to myself, are you serious? And Lou never forgot that. Lou never forgot that people so often and so quickly jump to conclusions and to judgments as if they had any right to jump to those conclusions or those judgments. And so he decided that he wasn't going to let others stop him from achieving. So, towards the end of his year 13, Lou decided to go to Duntroon Military College in Canberra, Australia, where he got given a free degree, three meals a day, his own room, and he got paid. It was quite literally his entire life's goals packaged into one neat little, little project, and he never forgot that. And knowing Lou, he eventually rose his way through the military,
actually Lou Gardner became Major General Lou Gardner of the New Zealand Army from 2004, where he served as Chief of the Army from 2006. This is Lou Gardner. Shame on that manager. And he served overseas in the anarchy of Somalia through to the rebuilding of East Timor, amongst other places. Thrown a fully paid for degree from Harvard Business School, and Lou quite literally had a complete arsenal of life lessons to throw at me when the need arose. And one particular teenage issue arose a lot, and that was the issue of inadequacy, when you don't feel you're good enough to achieve something. And for this, he would refer back to what he called the NASA story. So, one day as Major General, Lou Gardner heard of an official working at NASA. This official was condescendingly asking other people what they did for a living. Some would answer with, oh, I'm an engineer. Others would answer with, oh, I'm a technician. Until eventually, this official reached a man who was quietly mopping away outside the bathroom. And he asked the man, son, what do you do around here? And the man looked up and quietly responded, sir, I send people to the moon. Because you see, what this official seemed to forget was that for all of the grandeur and power that comes with ranks and titles, you need everybody, rank or no rank, to keep a massive engine like NASA well oiled. Or as Lou put it, engineers may build the rocket, technicians may put in the parts, but where do they go if there are no cooks? What do they do if they're busting to go to the toilet and all the toilets are out of action? So Lou was the kind of man to really pay attention to the tiniest details that everyone else would dismiss. And Lou's philosophy to teaching was very unique. He believed in teaching morality and teaching to the best degree possible. And he was not into the lecturing style that so many teachers seemed to adopt. He preferred the you do the work and I'll facilitate style. For example, he's very much into asking me questions like, what is it like being a UN peacekeeper? Are there issues with the UN? Questions that challenge how I think. And the classic, do people value order over freedom? Where he would just sit back in his chair and patiently wait, always patiently waiting for my response. And having been an old major general at that point, Lou definitely had a couple of things to say about any, any issue in society. But the biggest impact Lou had on me happened one afternoon when I went to him on careers day and I told him, Lou, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I told him of my dreams of representing New Zealand on the world stage as a professional diplomat. But I told him also that I wouldn't have a chance, that my chances were going to be so incredibly slim because of my ethnic background and age. And Lou looked at me and he sat me down, and he said to me, Amarind, do up your tie, it's messy. Oh crap, okay, sure. And then he said to me, Amarind, for goodness sake, I did not put my life on the line to hear you tell me that you are not good enough to achieve any of the amazing things that you are capable of. You were born here, you were raised here, you are a New Zealander by blood, and I will not let you believe that you do not have every equal opportunity to serve this amazing country as I did. Whoa. It took me a while to completely understand what he meant by what he said. But eventually, a couple of months later, when I told him that I had abandoned my nerves, applied for a scholarship to teach in Japan, threw caution to the wind, and reached out to one of our deputy ambassadors, he just looked at me and he grinned. And having been a teacher for a year, I definitely know that smile. It's that smile you give someone when you finally see them conquer their fear. Classic example would be when you're standing at the top of a ledge, screaming, oh my goodness, I can't do this leap of faith, and you're screaming to everyone below you, get me off, get me off, get me off, and then you jump anyway, and everyone there is smiling knowing that you've achieved something that is just so profoundly hard for you. And so a lot of what I've managed to achieve in life so far has really been down to Lou's influence. And his lesson was very simple, right? Youth as a concept 
was nothing more than a box that limited me from achieving my potential. Something we hear a lot of in New Zealand is people putting other young people down. Something that goes a little bit like this. Wow, Phil, he just made a new gimmick. Yeah, 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 but he's just 14. He's a nobody. He's a geek. Lou would instead say, if we dismiss the age factor and we hear the whole story, we might hear the fascinating truth. Wow, Phil Farnsworth, I hear he has made a new gimmick. He is calling it a television, which he did in 1921. But do you see how dismissing the age factor can make all the difference when discussing youth and problems in the society? So I decided to step up. I wasn't going to let myself be boxed in and held down by that title of youth. And I reached out to Victoria Hallam, who had been our permanent representative to UNESCO and deputy head of mission to France for a job at MFAT, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Massive government ministry, 24-7 protecting our country's good name, and quite possibly one of the most outrageous things she had ever heard in her life. But you fast forward a little bit, and alongside my English teaching, His Excellency Mark Sinclair, our ambassador to Japan, put me in contact with Misa Pitt, who was our senior marketing development manager at Education New Zealand at the Tokyo Embassy. This is where I got a taste for what it may be like to be a New Zealand diplomat as an intern. And as I'm sure Misa will be able to tell you, there wasn't a moment I was there where I wasn't smiling. It was a window into my dream. So I wasn't going to let my age or that derogatory descriptor of youth box me in and stop me from achieving what was in my grasp, what I could potentially do. So Takeshi and his question for me, he asked me how to overcome the stigma of youth to achieve his dreams. And my answer was quite simple, like Lou. It's about breaking down those barriers that are placed upon you for no relevant reason, like your background, your age, your orientation, your faith. It's about redefining what it means to be youth, making people see that youth doesn't translate to lazy teens or disinterested, untalented youth. But rather, quite simply, a youth is someone now who has the potential to perfect and to learn from those before them, to perfect that art, to be better. And the whole concept of the elderly and the youthful, let's remove these self-imposed barriers. And as a dear old friend once told me, Regardless of age, there is no reason why we cannot be the bloody best we can be in any circumstance, right? And Lou's final lesson to me was super simple, but hugely significant in how I act today, and I only wish that I listened to it more closely then. Lou said to me, never be satisfied, Amrind. Never be satisfied with what if or I wish I had. Live your life as if the last thing that comes out of your mouth is the last thing you are remembered for. Listen to others as if the last thing they were saying was the last piece of knowledge they were giving to you. But, Lou passed away last year, in 2015, from terminal cancer while I was at the Tokyo Embassy. I found out via a news article that tore my heart out of my chest especially so because I was at the embassy when I found out. He had been on treatment since 2014, the year where I first met him, but he never mentioned a thing. He shared so much of his happiness with me and I with him, but I didn't share any of this burden with him. I never got the chance to share with him any of the amazing work stories or the new moral dilemmas that I had thought of. I never got to see that grin telling him of what it felt like to serve New Zealand, finally, overseas. And being here today, really, is a chance for me to finally say goodbye to Lou. Because without Lou, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have done what I've managed to achieve. And Lou dedicated himself to serving others so that we can freely chase our dreams break down those barriers, achieve what we can achieve. And even when his health was fading 
and he had so little time left, he still opted to serve us by still being a teacher at college when he should have been spending time with his family, achieving his lifelong dream then. And I've never met a more wise and selfless person on this earth, and I still consider myself blessed to have served at least some part in his life. And so, as a dear old friend has now shown me, summon your courage. Remind yourself to not let other people use your age as a derogatory descriptor or as a barrier for you to achieve any of the amazing things that you are capable of. Tell yourself to remove the age factor when aspiring to achieve your dreams. Tell yourself that as we seek to redefine what it means to be youth, all we need to do is unshackle ourselves, lift our wings, and just fly. Thank you. <laughs>